Okay, um, the first session this afternoon is presented by Mike DeWitt uh, from the University of Stellenbosch. Mike's a long-term colleague of mine, obviously from our De Beers days. I think he was probably given an introduction yesterday um, for his presentation at that time. So I'll just allow Mike to uh, commence his presentation. Thanks, Mike. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Bill, for the introduction. And um, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about Botswana in a, in a delayed session that was supposed to have happened two days ago. So maybe it's a bit out of uh, sequence, but uh, nevertheless, um, I, talk, uh, I wanna give a little presentation about the Botswana uh, prospecting uh, history. Um, and it was really a presentation I gave at the Kimberlite Conference in, Bot in Gaborones a couple of years ago. Just in terms of where Botswana is, and, and uh, there is a map of Botswana with the, with the main Kimberlite fields, uh, and also showing the, uh, the main mines um, that, that uh, were discovered over the years, Orapa and Letlakani and Karowi in the north, uh, Juaneng in the south, and then Khahu and, and Rolorala, where attempts were made to mine these deposits, but they are dormant and uh, at care and maintenance at the moment. Just for your own in interest, um, globally there are about uh, 7,000 uh, Kimberlites in the order of. Um, there are about 700 of those that have, have diamonds in them of sorts, and only 70 of those um, are, are have been mined or are mined. So that's only really 1% of the Kimberlites found. And out of those, uh, there are only seven tier one, which, which are really world-class mines uh, that we have globally. So that's 0.1% of, uh, of the total diamonds discovered or kimberlites discovered globally. Now in Botswana, there are, there are nearly 400 kimberlites. There are six operating mines, uh, two have closed, uh, two are on feasibility, um, but it also contains two of those tier one deposits. So it is a very important uh, player in the global sense. Uh, and uh, at, at, uh, at this point in time, Botswana has produced um, well over 800 million carats of the, of the global uh, amount of around 5.6 billion carats globally um, estimated to have been, have been produced. So again, it just emphasizes that it's well overtaken South Africa in terms of uh, historical production. Uh, and it's, it, it is a, a very important player. Um, just a few points uh, for, um, for your um, information in terms of how we express kimberlites in terms of surface areas. We use hectares, and, and you may have heard that term several times. A hectare is about is 110,000 square meters. So um, one expresses this in terms of surface areas of various kimberlites. There's the Arapa kimberlite in, um, in Botswana, well over 100 hectares, a very big kimberlite almost as big as the biggest um, in Africa, the uh, Madui Kimberlite. And then there's the Joanen Kimberlite with uh, almost 37 hectares, also a very big uh, Kimberlite. Um, just to recap for, for the case of your information, the carrot is 0.2 of a gram. It has a hardness of a SG of 2.52 and a hardness of 10. Grades we often talk about in many of the talks uh, is expressed in carrots per 100 ton. And values are often talked about is in terms uh, is expressed in dollars per carat. That's just to add some uh, background to it. In terms of uh, Botswana and Bekuana land, as it was called in the past, um, I've sort of subdivided it in, in three stages, and I'm not going to hamper a lot on the first two stages. But it's interesting that um, there there were, like many parts in Africa, um, certainly people that were mining. Um, and and um, digging out uh, stones for various tools, um, and that these tools are recognized as the earlier middle and late stone age periods. Um, minerals were used uh, at, for pigments and paint, rock paintings, decorative purposes, and also early mining uh, in Botswana was, has been recognized both in, in terms of copper, uh, gold, and iron. Um, then in, in terms of historical uh, it, part of, of, uh, of Botswana, and that really started in, in 1860s when 
uh, gold was rediscovered in the Francistown area, and that led to various prospecting stages for diamonds, and we'll go over that. And then in, in 1959 is really what, when the modern diamond exploration program started in Botswana with first diamonds being found uh, by Consolidated African Selection Trust and followed by De Beers, Falcon Ridge and various other uh, major companies. So if we just go back to the prehistoric times, it's uh, the Mahari Khari Pans is a very interesting place in terms of that. Uh, you can recognize, you can even see that on Google Earth, you can recognize various uh, strand lines along the pans, which uh, illustrate the level of water, water that uh, that was in in those uh, pans and on the edges and along the edges of of these strand lines, one can find artifacts where people were uh, picking up stones and um, transferring these into tools for use as very purposes. And it's interesting that uh, some of the early stone uh, age artifacts have been found near Arapa. But also um, some um, artifacts have been picked up at the base of the Kalahari on top of some of the Kimberlites. So that, that gives you a sense of uh, the depositional period of the uh, Kalahari sands that must have come in after uh, the um, early Stone Age. Um, in, in terms of uh, using um, minerals for pigmentation and, and, and so on. There's, there are some mines at uh, Tsodila Hills in the northwest of Botswana, one of the bigger hills in, in, in the country. Um, and uh, there's a little uh, photograph of, uh, of the old mining sites and there are some very nice rock paintings on those rocks in, uh, at Tsodilo. Um, but also there are some prehistoric uh, copper mines in the, um, the Dukwa, in this in the sort of eastern part of, um, of Botswana. And these are still being uh, examined, uh, particularly people like, um, uh, for, there are some people in, in uh, Francistan that are uh, in investigating and looking at how these various minerals were mined between uh, 800 AD and uh, 1200 AD. However, if we go back to, if we start looking at the historic, proper historic mining, um, that first of all, in 1866, gold was rediscovered in the Tati area, and there was a lot of activity there till about the 1970s when diamonds were found in Kimberley, and a lot of these uh, early discoverers moved back to moved to Kimberley rather. Um, in 1885, Southern Bekuana land became a British protectorate, and uh, five years later, it, it, they included the uh, the northern part of Botswana, separated by the 22, 22 degrees. Um, the, the green line. So it was two in two stages that um, Bekuana land became a protectorate for from the from the British. In 1895, the, big, the three main chiefs of the three main um, uh, three areas um, were concerned about the uh, um, influence of Cecil John Rhodes, particularly uh, after. Uh, he started um, annexing the, uh, the Rhodesians and they were concerned about uh, the Botswana's independence and they went to England to plead uh, for Bekuana Land to remain a protectorate and not to be transferred to Cecil John Rhodes Company, the British South African Company, uh, and that was successfully achieved. Um, so in 1896, after that event, um, the first expedition of some real prospecting took place uh, in northeast Botswana. And this was a company called the British West Charterland uh, Limited. And if you go back to um, the, the, the director's um, uh, documents and so on, these were uh, many of those directors of that company were actually personal friends of Cecil John Rhodes. So it was quite clear of, um, of how he wanted to establish uh, the presence of diamonds and gold in Botswana. Now, so he sent an expedition to uh, Ngami land in the northwestern part of Botswana, a very difficult place to get to. And this was led by a German by the name of Sigrid Passage. Um, and um, they spent three years exploring uh, this part of uh, Botswana. He um, wrote a, a very extensive document on that, produced also the first geological maps of that part of the world didn't find any Kimberlites, um, covered areas where uh, uh, quite a long time later, 1979 and 2009, the first Kimberlites were in fact discovered. 
Um, interesting, he, he wrote this book, it's uh, available, it's about 800 pages, it's, it's all in German. Um, so if you're quite keen to read that, um, it's, uh, it's quite a challenge. But he was a, a doctor by training and he ended up as a professor in geography. He was a naturalist and he had a very great interest in, in things like termites, for instance. And there's some fantastic drawings of how termites operated in that part of the world. And we'll get to the importance of that a little later. Um, there were no diamonds and gold was found, but he was obviously not permitted at the time to release any results. Um, some years later, after that uh, expedition, uh, Alex, Alex de Torrey came into uh, Botswana. He was working for um, the first for the Geological Commission when he came to South Africa, but then for the uh, Irrigation Department uh, as a hyd hydrogeologist. And uh, they wanted to know if they could some way dam off the rivers in the Mahalikhan area to uh, fill this area with water and, and change the climate for agricultural purposes. So um, um, Alex de Torrey spent some years there and he wrote a very interesting uh, paper called uh, The Crustal Movements as a Factor of Geographical Evolution of South Africa, uh, where he identified these, uh, these uh, what he called upwarps in the crust uh, in several areas in Southern Africa. And again, we'll get to that as a, in, in a, a little later as of the importance of that. He, after, the, uh, after his spell with, as, a, as a hydrogeologist, he became chief consult, consulting geologist for the Beers where he retired. And he in fact prospected parts of Botswana on behalf of the Beers. Just a little background on the Bangwawati Reserve where the, uh, the gold and the copper was discovered. Um, the Karma III, who was chief of the, of the reserve, signed an agreement with, uh, with a company, uh, North Goldfields Exploration. Uh, and, uh, but Cecil Leon Rhodes took that, took that company over in 19, 1893, obviously keen to get into Botswana. But uh, Karma's uh, III successor, uh, Sirkedi, was not keen on, uh, on, the, on that uh, initial agreement. And they had a long uh, renegotiations to revisit this agreement. And eventually they came to an, a tanker agreement and Anglo and the Beers entered Botswana as the Victoria Prospecting Company Limited. And two years later, I, um, Anglo abandoned it, but Alex de Toy, who believed that there were certainly Kimberlites in Botswana, um, felt that uh, it was worth car carrying on because they, al although they hadn't found any um, interesting uh, results, they did uh, identify several areas with, uh, with substantial gravel deposits. And he convinced the beers to do some testing of some of those gravels um, and uh, found the first diamonds, uh, authentic diamonds in Botswana in the south uh, eastern part corner of, uh, of that country. Uh, however, the beers then uh, after that pulled out and, um, uh, and, and it was many years later that, that they came back. Just a bit of background on uh, Cedric Cady. He, he was the second son of Karma III and therefore he was not eligible to become his successor, but the son of the oldest uh, Karma son, uh, Soretsi, was only four when his father died and um, he was too young to, uh, to take over from Karma III. So uh, Sakedi became the, uh, the guardian until much later after Suresi uh, Karma went to Oxford uh, in the UK, married uh, Ruth, which caused a, an interesting political uh, uh, aspect uh, of Botswana, entered politics and but became the first president at independence in 1966. However, uh, Tsukedi did feel that uh, development should take place in Botswana, and he signed an agreement with uh, the Rhodesian Selection Trust in 1959. Uh, he didn't want to sign any agreements with South African companies because of the politics. Um, and um, this African Selection Trust got the rights to prospect for copper, but he also got the rights to look for, for precious stones. They had been working in, uh, in Sierra Leone for many years, um, and they came to do some bulk sampling in that eastern part here of Botswana. Um, and in fact, found some, they found the first diamonds uh, in, in a stream sampling program. 
this is a, an old map of their uh, of their reports that they submitted to the to the uh, um, to the government, and you can see the position and uh, the sizes of the diamonds that they recovered from their stream sampling. They 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 didn't work further west a eh, because they uh, they came across they it was the start of the Kalahari Basin and they were felt they weren't equipped to uh, handle the sand and, and sample the sand more to the west. And they also thought that um, there are some Dwaika in the, in, the, um, in the Maklutsi. They thought that maybe these diamonds had come out of the, out of the Dwaika. So they, they dropped the ground and, and basically left, uh, left the uh, country. So uh, the, the next person that of, of importance of uh, the discovery of Kimberlites in Botswana was Gavin Lamont. He was a, uh, he did his PhD in the um, von Reinstorp area and his external examiner was Alex de Tori. So he, he knew Alex uh, to some extent. Uh, when he finished, uh, Alex suggested that he should uh, do some, uh, get experience in, uh, in African countries. So he went to Southern Rhodesia and then he went to uh, the Bekuyana Protectorate and joined first the geological survey in 1949, but then joined the Anglo-American, the Beers, group in Botswana to start exploring again in, uh, in Botswana. And one of the things that, uh, that he, he found is uh, that uh, the termites may have had a major impact in bringing material from below the Kalahari sands to the surface. And he was quite keen to sample these. Um, uh, there is a very interesting book and it's uh, first published in 1925 by uh, Eugene Moret. It's very interesting to read. Um, and it, it describes how ants, how they um, develop and how they live underground and, and move massive amount of material to the surface. So he um, um, uh, Gavin felt that uh, bioturbation by termites over hundreds of thousands of years has brought to the surface from kimberlite pipes, the garnets and ilmenites that we were able to successfully use in our soil sampling program. So that, that was his, his take on, on uh, the termites. It's, it's worth looking at that because it's applied in many other countries in, in Australia as well in geochemical sampling where they use uh, termite activities. The way that Gavin Lamont then started prospecting in Botswana, he, uh, he had uh, large teams and uh, they walked the ground along um, uh, cut lines that they made, uh, north-south cut lines, and then they walked the ground from the cut lines five miles in, a mile across and five miles out. And a sampling team would consist of a team leader, a wheel pusher who would measure um, the distance with his uh, chronometer on his wheel. Uh, you had uh, two samplers on either side of the team leader, and then a whole bunch of porters that would carry the samples back and forth from, from, the, uh, from the baseline. There's a photograph of a typical uh, sampling team. They would then scoop every 12 to 15 paces, a scoop. They would put it uh, uh, through a, um, a, a sample splitter and every 0.2 of a mile, the team leader would blow a, a police whistle and uh, two bags were filled in, in one bag and, um, and every one point, so that would what we'd be one sample and every, um, so every 1.2 miles were six, six samples that would have to be carried back uh, while they're going on the, on the traverse back to the, uh, the baseline where a vehicle would be waiting to layer it up. So that was quite a, 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 a military style operation that worked like clockwise. Uh, and um, that's just a, a photograph of the, the guy taking a scoop sample, dumps it into the sample splitter. And there's a photograph of the, uh, the guy with the, uh, the wheel. He's, he's got a, a compass in his hand as well. And he's also carrying uh, two of the samples. So multitasking, if you like. They, in, in addition to the sampling that, uh, that uh, Lamont introduced, he also looked at the concentrating methods. And that took a while for him to realize that uh, panning for, 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 for um, indicator minerals was not very efficient. And he decided to start screening the samples and hand gravitating these in a, in a drum as, as we spoke, uh, as we discussed yesterday. 
in that way, the first one of the first things that the PS did is to resample the area that um, that uh, the uh, selection trust had had sampled, and they found um, two diamonds in approximately the same place as as, um, as selection trust. But the other thing that they found was they found uh, garnets, ilmenites, and even CDs. So that was a, a step forward in terms of uh, recognizing uh, the possibility of finding perhaps a uh, um, a, um, a primary source. Lamont was very keen on this area, but the, the licenses uh, had been, uh, some of the licenses had been uh, uh, expired, so they were then working in other areas. Um, but uh, going back, the reason why um, Lamont was interesting and interested in this area was there is the uh, rough position of uh, the diamonds that are found in the Maclutzi River, and that's the rough position of the Rapa province. And it's separated by this uh, Kalahari Rhodesia axis of Alex Atori. And um, the theory was that this up axis would have um, dissected the drainage that originally would have come across this axis. Um, and the upwarp of this axis would have uh, cut this, uh, this river system. Uh, and therefore, the source of the diamonds of the Maclutia, upper Maclutia River would have to be on the other side of the upwarp. That was certainly a strong um, uh, case that, uh, that the toy made. Before getting to that, uh, the beers were busy in the southern part. They found their first uh, so-called kimberlites. They, they were not true kimberlites, but uh, nevertheless, they found uh, two uh, pipes that were very interesting. Uh, and it gave them, um, it gave them the confidence to, uh, that the, the technique that they were applying in terms of screening and uh, loam sampling that it worked. And um, they, at the same time, there was a person called uh, uh, Chris Jennings who started working at the Geological Survey two, ways, two years after Gavin Lamont left. He was mainly into groundwater and made use of extensive use of geophysics. In fact, he did his PhD on, on, in Botswana on the hydrogeology. Um, and he, his interest really was uh, geophysics, um, and he left, also left the, uh, the survey uh, and in 1971 and joined a company called Falconbridge. Now, in, in, before he, he, uh, he left um, the survey, he and, and um, Lamont were fairly close. I mean, it was a small geological community, so everybody knew each other. And he invited um, Jennings to come and do some tests of geophysical surveys over the maturity bodies that they just discovered. And um, the conclusion that Jennings came with, he applied various techniques, seismics, electrics, and so on, is that magnetic, magnetics was really one of the better tools to use. And in 1968, after the discovery of AK-1, um, in fact, uh, Jennings came up to do some uh, test lines over, over that, uh, that Kimberlite. So getting back to uh, Lamont and, uh, and the, uh, the upwarp, there's a, a, a Google 3D image of that upwarp. Um, he, the beers had been in Botswana now more than 10 years and they hadn't had much success, so they were putting the pressure on. They gave uh, give, uh, Lamont another couple of months to do uh, what he felt he, what he had, that he had wanted to do in the first place, is to go to this area and do some very crude uh, road sampling. Um, they collected various large uh, scoop samples. Uh, they camped at a little pan with a bit of water, and they found that 12 of those scoop samples were full of indicator minerals, garnets and ilmenites. So they, they then knew that they were onto something. And this was in July 1966. It was just before independence, September 1933. Botswana became independent, and the first president was Sir Siretsikama. He was a very uh, wise uh, diplomat. And one of the things that he did was to, to invite all the chieftains um, to a, a, a conference in which they decided that all the, 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 uh, the wealth of Botswana should not be part of, uh, go to the chieftains, but should be part of the, the nation, irrespective of where it was found. The, shortly after um, independence, uh, the Beers managed to get their licenses, and um, they sent Manfred Marx there in 1976, 
And he in fact found the first Kimball out by doing some detailed sampling, digging a pit PK1 in March uh, the 1st, 1976. This was followed very shortly thereafter by uh, BK2, and then the big one that he found in, in April uh, 25th uh, of the same year. <clears throat> this, uh, the, the team that they, that uh, made the, the uh, that recovered the first indicators of the first sample over AK1, which is the Arapa mine. And the, uh, there's the, the mineral count, uh, a, a microabundance of, of ilmenites, garnets, and, and CDs. In fact, uh, Gavin Lamont uh, still, I've got a letter with, with, uh, with from Gavin Lamont with the first indicators from Arapa stuck on it. Uh, which he gave me um, when I when I discussed this his the history with him in in some detail. Now uh, there were some air photographs available for, uh, for of that area at the time, uh, and it shows you very clearly the outline of AK one. There's AK one uh, on on the photograph, uh, but also some of the other Kimberlites shown. There's hardly any cover here. There's some calcrete that developed over these, over these uh, bodies, and there's some dolerite dikes that are stand out very nicely. Um, but that was, uh, it, it's a very nice uh, photograph uh, to show you that if you do go into these areas, as, as discussed yesterday, do have a look at air photographs of places. You'll be surprised what, to see what you, what you can find out of that. It was interesting because this particular feature was used by the uh, by SA Airways and their flights from Johannesburg to London as a beacon uh, on, their, on their trajectory. And the uh, initial evaluation of Arapa was done with a rotary pen that came from, uh, from Kimberley. It was a six foot pen, quite a small one actually. Uh, and uh, small pits were dug uh, nine by nine foot, 20 foot deep. Uh, but this was, sure, when, when the results start coming in, this was uh, fairly quickly overtaken. Uh, with uh, with the introduction of a DMS plant and, and much deeper and and uh, uh, well organized um, uh, pits, um, the the first diamonds that came out were quickly uh, identified and and uh, obviously added to the excitement of this discovery. Airborne surveys were flown, and I showed you this this thing yeah this these photographs yesterday. That's a, a very early stage. Um, uh, airborne survey, but also an input electric magnetic system, which was uh, attached. There you can see the wiring to this uh, Catalino aircraft. Um, that's the uh, the, the uh, status of the discovery of the Rapa uh, Kimberlites as we see it. There's about uh, 85 Kimberlites. It's probably close to 90 now. A lot of them are quite small. A lot of them have very few are, are very are no diamonds. There are only, um, four, well, there are four mines that have come out of this. That's AK1 up here. Then there's the uh, Damsha, which are two Kimberlites, BK9 and BK12 here. Letlakani mine, two Kimberlites, and then the Koroa Kimberlite. But people are still looking at BK11, BK16, and several others. So it's, it's still a work in progress in, in many respects. Uh, and people are still exploring in this in this part of the world, hoping to find un undiscovered Kimberlites. That's what the open pit looks like a uh, couple, two or three years ago. Uh, it's 180 hectares in size. It was commissioned in 1971 after being found in 1967. A really very fast um, move from uh, exploration into mining, and it's produced well over 400 million carats, an enormous. Uh, contributor, contributor to the uh, global um, diamond uh, pool. It's got a, it's got a very interesting crater uh, with uh, lots of interesting fossils in them, uh, and it tells us quite a bit about the paleo environment uh, at the discovery of at about ninety five at the um, emplacement of uh, ninety five million years of this uh, of this body. It was officially opened by Sir Suresh Karma and Harry Oppenheimer. Uh, and it's interesting that quite soon uh, they realized that they have to form a, uh, they formed a joint venture company between government and Botswana, a 50-50 joint venture, which was uh, obviously very advantageous for the state. But uh, the, beer, the beers, I think, did a, a, a marvelous coup there uh, and set themselves well up in, in Botswana. 
in the meantime, sampling was going on in, in other parts of the world and, and uh, sampling was going on in, in, uh, in the Zhuaneng area. This area had been sampled in 62, but no, no grains had at that time been, been recovered. And it was really because uh, the, A, the, uh, it was, um, the, the sampling technique was still on the old side the old uh, way of doing things and also the concentrating was done by panning and not by screening. So the first reconnaissance results, positive results came out in uh, 69, then detailed sampling was done. And these, this produced various uh, ilmenite anomalies over these bodies and drilling started in uh, 71 on uh, DK, DK1 and DK2, but failed to find to intersect any kimberlite. And it's very interesting because they were using a, a vol tractor mounted drill that was used in Arapa. In Arapa, there is no cover. And uh, the, uh, the limit of, uh, of depth of this particular drill was 50 meters. And uh, so uh, the cover in that area is 50 meters. So the initial holes were drilled uh, without success. But um, after rethinking and uh, giving, putting a bit more effort in it, the first Kimberlite was in fact drilled in, in 1972 under, uh, under supervision of Stuart Verko with uh, Norman Locke on the team. Uh, and this followed fairly quickly with the discovery of uh, several other Kimberlites and by 1979, 10 uh, Kimberlites uh, had been, or 11 Kimberlites had been discovered. The next uh, problem really is now to evaluate um, uh, the Xuanang Kimberlite. It was under 50 meters of cover. Drilling started using a jumper drill. Um, this had a, a very large uh, bit, uh, almost a half a meter in diameter. Um, but um, because of the, uh, uh, the low penetration, the penetration rate was started at about five meters per shift, but soon, uh, once kimberlite was intersected, harder kimberlite was intersected, reduced to about a meter per shift, which was surely not enough, uh, was surely far, far too slow to cover all these holes and get a, a decent sample for the first evaluation project. In addition, they also found that a lot of the diamonds that, uh, that were, came out of the holes using this technology uh, were broken. So this, uh, this Technology was later replaced by um, rotary percussion drilling, uh, and um, uh, and it proved to be a, a much more uh, effective tool. And Joanne uh, came in into production in, in 1982. That's a, a bit of an older slide of uh, of Joanne. It's a massive uh, pit of three adjacent kimberlites. It was commissioned in 1982 and so far has produced 300, almost all, also almost 400 million carats. So between Arapa and, and Zhuaneng, um, Botswana produced well over 800 million carats with uh, Arapa, Zhuaneng and, and um, Arapa each with about uh, 400 million carats each. Uh, it's presently uh, going down to uh, the, the pit is planned to go down to 625 meters. Um, it's, it's got a high grade uh, and uh, it's really a, 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 one of the richest resources of any commodity that one can think of in terms of uh, revenue per ton. When the, uh, cut is, the cut is finished, you can almost fit two Eiffel Towers into the open pit, a mega pit, so to speak. Um, it, there is obviously huge cost involved and uh, uh, the, 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 at the time, the planning was to spend uh, three billion US dollars to, to get this pit done because of the uh, the overburden stripping. Um, but uh, it takes the mine through to uh, to well over twenty twenty eight. Antoine Ang has produced some some fabulous uh, diamonds. One doesn't hear a lot about it, uh, unfortunately. Uh, more recently, uh, it it has discovered uh, recovered. A, um, a, a massive uh, diamond. Um, so it, it certainly has, uh, has produced some very, uh, very uh, interesting and uh, very valuable uh, stones. This is the latest large stone of over a thousand carat that came out uh, last year. Um, gives you some idea what it looks like. Probably a, it looks a bit like a type two. I'm, I'm actually not sure if we know that yet. Um, but certainly uh, they do occur at Chuaneng at, uh, at quite a rate. 
Um, and and, and during this time, there was a, a publication in uh, Economic Geology by the Geological Survey that uh, on gold, base metal, and diamonds in Botswana. But there was a map in there in which they showed what areas the beers had covered and what areas the beers had proved to be positive. Now, the beers hadn't been able to get to all these areas where they had uh, positive uh, results. And um, so uh, this, this information was taken over by Falconbridge, who then decided to look at areas where the beers hadn't got to yet and where positive results had come out in the early days. And they focused uh, a lot of their work in uh, the Tsabong and Kokong area, and also started working in the Central Hari Kalahari Game Reserve. Their, their approach was very different. They decided not to uh, necessarily use uh, the walking military approach of Gavin Lamont, but they used the um, helicopter support sampling. And also their drilling was very different. They, uh, they used uh, uh, a technique that uh, Chris Jennings knew existed in Canada and, uh, and was able to drill these, uh, these, hole, these, these targets that they were getting also from their airborne geophysics. Remember, Chris Jennings was a was was deep thick into into geophysics, and he believed very much on the airborne geophysics. So they they flew big areas, and they found a lot of kimberlites um, between uh, in in four years that they were in in Botswana. They discovered sixty two kimberlites. So their their approach was was good, but they uh, they didn't uh, weren't successful in finding anything of uh, of uh, uh, economic interest, except um, in the Central Kalahari Game Reserve, where this is a photograph of Andy Lamont and Andy Moore in his early days. He was uh, doing soil sampling by helicopter in, in the Kalahari Game Reserve. They covered this area fairly quickly and um, were able to, to find various anomalies, but in, in, in one of which was, uh, was Hopi, what was called Hopi 25, it's now called Chahu. Uh, and um, and certainly a, a kimberlite with diamonds in it. The problem with, with that kimberlite is that it was sitting under 80 meters of Kalahari cover and, um, and uh, evaluation was tough. It's a 10, 10 hand hectare body uh, and it's been sitting on the shelf for a long time before, um, um, before uh, Gem Diamonds took it over who had a go at it and put in a, a decline, which we'll come to in a minute. Um, the beers then start, started soil sampling. There's your soil sampling grids in, in the east of the country where there was no cover. And they found two, uh, two small clusters of kimberlites. Interesting enough, both of very different ages, one of 1300 and one of 500 million years, um, in, in the uh, close to the Limpopo River. Um, one of cluster of which uh, contained diamonds and the other which was um, which was barren. These were very small in size, 0.2 to 2 hectares, uh, but had a reasonable grade. But their diamond uh, quality was was not um, what what a uh, what made it what would have made it economic. So that those projects were shelved for the moment. Um, and in 2003, a lot of interest came back to Arapa and people started re-looking at some of the uh, Kimball Ashton beers had found. This was AK, at, the, at the time called AK-6. It was reported by the beers as a three hectare body and had a grade of three and a half carats per hundred ton. Uh, it was revisited by um, African Diamonds. And uh, it sure, certainly came out that this Kimballite was actually much bigger and had a much better grade. Um, it has produced, it was certainly subsequently taken over by Lakara Diamonds and produced some fabulous diamonds, which uh, Ray Ferrara spoke about early in the week. Uh, certainly one of some of these uh, very large, um, very special stones have come out, out, of that, uh, out of that deposit. In fact, if you, if you look at uh, some of the results since 2012, when they started mining it, over 200 diamonds of $1 million each have come out of that deposit. It just shows you the value of that particular, um, particular Kimberlite and what sort of stones it has produced. It's just incredible. I don't think there's anything like it uh, on this earth. It's produced three diamonds over a thousand carats. It produced 25 diamonds over 300 carats. It's just 
an incredible uh, producer of, uh, of big stars. And having recognized this, um, Lucara uh, started changing their plant structure to avoid any major breakages of these big diamonds. Uh, they put in autogenous milling, they put in uh, XRT, X-ray transmission uh, technology to try and detect diamonds before it enters the crushing circuit to try and recover diamonds that, uh, that, uh, that would have otherwise uh, probably have broken, been broken. Going back to the Gecho, uh, or the Gopi deposit that was found by Falcon Bridge, eventually in 2012, um, Term Diamonds decided to, to try and give it a go. They put a decline in under the Kalahari into the Kimberlite. Um, and they acquired this uh, from the Beers after the Beers had acquired it from Falcon Bridge. Uh, it was opened in 2014, but it was put on care and maintenance in 2017. And incredibly difficult mining conditions. Um, the, the instability of the overburden uh, made things difficult. There were water problems. Um, so it's, it's certainly, it's an underground mine, but certainly not a one that, uh, that has um, faced the test of times at this stage. Just uh, to then summarize in terms of where, where the, the discoveries were made and, and sort of what time and at what interval, there was certainly the 60s and the 70s up to this point in time were big periods for, for the beers. Um, this time, time in, the, in the late 70s, early 80s uh, is the period of, of uh, Falcon Bridge uh, and then the beers finding uh, additional discoveries um, but by sort of early 2000s, um, the sort of discovery rates dropped dramatically. Uh, and um, at the moment, um, the, the amount of discoveries from what's coming in from this corner are, are quite small. Uh, it's also interesting to see that all these, all these early discoveries were made by sampling using elmanites right up to almost 2007, when uh, people start looking at garnet anomalies and using geophysics. Um, so it shows you the, the importance of ilmenites, and it's certainly finding all the, the, uh, the group two, the, the group one Kimberlites. Remember group two Kimberlites don't contain any ilmenites and you get also group one Kimberlites that haven't got any ilmenites. So I think there's still quite a lot of potential of uh, expanding on the exploration and looking at some of those uh, garnet, uh, early garnet recoveries. Interesting, this, is, uh, this period is really where all the mines were found, the Dirapa, the Zhuaneng. Um, and after that, lots of, many, several Kimberlites, but uh, not something that, uh, that you can get your teeth in. In terms of production, uh, what, what Botswana has produced, we sit with Botswana sitting now at about um, 850 million carats, uh, and it shows you the amount of carats with time. Uh, and when different Kimberlites came into production, Europa, uh, Letlakane, Juaneng, there was a big jump in the, uh, Juaneng, big push on the Kimberlites, new plants, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, at, if you look at the GDP of Botswana at the time of discovery, it was $84. In 2018, I, I'm afraid I haven't updated this, but it was well, uh, well 100 times higher than it, than it was in, in those days. So it has done enormous amount for Botswana as a country, uh, the development of country, um, the uh, tar roads, the clinics, the universities, the schools. Um, it's, uh, uh, and, and a lot of that had to do with the, the vision that both Karma and um, Harry Oppenheimer had in terms of forming a 50-50 joint venture, um, making that a, a, a state company uh, and um, uh, a partly state company and channeling all those funds back into the country. So my view of Botswana is it'll remain a major player in producing diamonds for decades to come. But to me, it's also still a very attractive country for exploration. And I think this is something that you, you're gonna have to think about. Uh, it's a country that's got uh, great cover, not only for Kalahari, but also for uh, Karoo. Um, there are, we have definitely got um, pre karoo Kimberlites in Botswana in the, in the east. So uh, there's no reason why there shouldn't be more uh, towards the west. 
the Kalahari cover makes exploration quite difficult. So we have to really think about um, carefully how uh, you would tackle uh, the future of Botswana. Um, but uh, it, A, it's politically stable, uh, and B, it's got a good infrastructure, uh, and, and, and most importantly, it's a very, geologically a very attractive target still for uh, diamond exploration. Um, I just got maybe just one comment. I mean, I've looked, we've looked a lot at the, uh, at the toys uplift axes. Um, I've wondered, you know, that maybe they're not recent uplift axes. They're, they're more like uh, fossil watersheds, um, you know, because they really separate areas uh, where Karoo is on one side and not on the on the other side. So perhaps we've had uh, gradual downward erosion of the old landscapes and then you expose those watersheds, which is why that one around Baklutsi is now, um, you know, being exposed and it's been the old Okavango drainage has been now cut off from the Limpopo drainage. Yeah, Bill, I, 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 I can't agree more with you, actually. I've always had a problem with uh, with these upwarps, even in South Africa, uh, you know, going through the Lichtenberg area and so on. Um, but I mean, it's, it's, it's just that it's interesting that um, that uh, the toys theory was tested by Lamont. And, and uh, I, I, I don't want to go into the, 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 tech, the technical side of things, but um, it was, it's an interesting theory and, and it did lead uh, whether it's, it's a, 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 a recent upwarp or whether it's an old drainage divide, it did lead them to, to the discovery. So it's an interesting, interesting story from that point of view. Um, but I, I do agree. I think a lot of these uh, features that we see are in fact all uh, pre karoo already. You can see how the Dwyker sort of avoids some of those um, so those axes. So uh, I, I, I tend to agree that I think these things are old things. They may have had a bit of rejuvenation here and there, but um, I think the origin lies well uh, back in, his, in geological time. Yeah, some of these features may actually be, as I, I said the other day, pre in age. Yeah, um, exactly. You know, if you look at the Michalisberg, um, you know, uh, sort of trend there, because that's the, the eastern, east-west trending one that the toy has. Um, you know, that could have existed in pre waterberg times. Yeah. Yeah. This, I think that some of these things are very old. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, the floor is open for questions. Um, Tanya, have you seen the chat? I haven't seen anything. Yes, there are a couple of questions in the in the chat um, from, from Ketso, who asks, Mike, with little erosion on the Arapa pipes, where exactly do you think the diamonds found in the Mitlutsi River came from? Well, it's a, it's a very good question, actually, and it's exactly what we're talking about now, because the present day uh, erosion of the little erosion that Arapa has uh, experienced, the present day erosion and the uh, tail of those diamonds is actually going to the northwest into the Mahari Hari pans. And there are some gravels that, uh, that the Beers have looked at, uh, they're called the airborne pan gravels, and they are definitely mineralized. Um, so whether the diamonds that are found in the Maklutsi are actually from Arapa is a very good question. There may be not be. Maybe, and, and I have thought about that a lot and, um, and I've looked at that western part of Arapa quite carefully uh, when I was still working with Todilo. Um, so I think there's still potential for that uh, and, and therefore we shouldn't exclude that idea at all. Um, I think that's, that's a, a very good point and maybe that whole axis and the discovery of Arapa was just coincidental as, as we just discussed early on. His second question, and there are three of them. The second one is, where is the next frontier in diamond exploration in Botswana? Well, you've got to pay me to, uh, to give you that answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what uh, is, what's the potential of alluvials in the Mitlutsi River and other ancient rivers in central Botswana? 
Mike, you need to add in it's upfront money, not after the event. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, Paul, and it's dollars, it's dollars, not rands. <laughs> well, we'll take pull us. Um, the, the, the first question is, uh, where is the next frontier? I, I still think that you have to look at the, uh, the, the uh, Archean. So you have to put up your Archean craton on that. That would then be quite, uh, uh, it would sort of take half the country away, the Western and Northern part. But, Sorry, Tanya, um, will, you let, will you let Herman in? Sorry. And, and then, um, that, that area, I think, west of, of Arapa is, is deserves a lot more attention, west and south of Arapa. So that's an area that, uh, that I was always quite keen on. In terms of the Maklutsi being a alluvial, I don't think there's potential for that. Detroit tested that with, uh, with his team from Kimberley. They did a bulk sampling of the um, Maklutsi. Actually didn't find anything in that. Um, and the diamonds really that occur in, to some extent, on the alluvials would be from Arapa. Uh, it is very interesting to speculate uh, where diamonds would have gone from the Joanneng uh, pipe, and that's something that a lot of people uh, would like to get some answers on. But uh, the Malopo River has produced some diamonds, and there certainly are some terraces that have, people have tested. Um, towards uh, the, uh, the middle, middle pit side, a bit, bit more to the uh, west on the Malopo. But as, you, as I've shown you, the toy tested some of the gravels uh, south of um, Labazzi and did find some diamonds. And these are probably linked more to the, uh, to the Lichtenberg side uh, and the Mafia King side of, of things. This next part of that question is a potential alluvials Matluzzi River and other ancient rivers in central Botswana. You really touched on it as you went through the discussion. And John Blaine just commenting, how about the Arapa discovery being serendipitous? Uh, Lamont and Gibson just doing the right thing in the wrong place at the right time. Well, they, were, they were certainly doing the, the, the right thing. Um, I think the rationale was probably, you know, my view is the rationale was was correct. Um, you know, just the only thing might be, as we discussed now, the the age of of those up of those uplifts. Yeah. Like the, the other thing is, um, of course, that Okavango drainage, you know, goes all the way back up into Botswana, so uh, into Angola. So Angola could have been a source of some of those diamonds. Yeah. Uh, and then in, then Arapa becomes serendipitous in terms of Maklutsi diamonds and even Sita, because you have those diamonds in the alluvials at, at Sita as well, which um, you can explain as, you, you know, people can say, well, they've must have come from Venetia, but those alluvials sit on top of the Karoo. Yeah. And if they are, um, you know, they would have to have been very recently deposited uh, when Venetia was first exposed from, uh, you know, by the stripping of the taru of the Karoo. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's lots of, uh, this, this, this uh, Maklutsi is certainly not, um, sorted out in terms there, there are still possibilities I think there and, and I, I favor almost a more proximal source but um, that that's just my personal preference that I don't we don't see any diamonds uh, along the Okavanga actually um, at least reported diamonds along the Okavanga up to uh, up to to until we get to Arapa but yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, so I think that uh, Botswana is still a very attractive country to work and uh, there, I think we're still in for some surprises there. <laughs>